Welcome to Vertical City. I'm your host, Lennon Richardson. During each episode, I interview one of the world's top experts in architecture, urban design, engineering, or ecology, so that we can better understand and develop solutions for sustainable living. Thank you for listening, and get ready to join us on another groundbreaking and uplifting episode. Lynn King is a graduate from Princeton University with a BA focusing on visual art, art history, and East Asian studies. She obtained a master's degree in human and organization development from the Fielding Institute and has since went on to complete several postgraduate programs, including certifications in aquaponics, systems development, global leadership, and social entrepreneurship. Lynn lives in Shanghai where this interview is conducted and where she is helping to spark an ecologically sourced local food movement. In this interview, we discuss the strengths and limitations of locally sourced food from health, environment, food security, and community development perspectives and how these factors might play into the creation of vertical cities. We also dive into some of the social and cultural aspects that should be considered prior to developing these communities and what we might do to ensure that vertical cities promote thriving cultures. For links and complete show notes, visit verticalcity.org slash podcast. All right, well, Lynn, welcome to the Vertical City Podcast. Thank you so much, Lennon. It's a pleasure and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show as well. Um, I'd like to start just by having you give us an overview of some of the projects you're working on. Okay, so uh, right now I'm involved in two uh, big projects. One is called Farm to Kitchen and it's about supporting local eco-growers or local eco-farmers in the Shanghai area and supporting their um, promoting them to the local, to the general public, and to help people understand why it's so important to eat organically grown or ecologically grown food. And the other project I'm doing is called Fish Garden, and it's about urban aquaponics. Actually, the two are very related. They're both about how to create sustainable food security and food safety, and help people to recognize the relationship between health, environment, and food security, that there's an inter- integrated, uh, there's an integral and an intimate connection between all these three. Yeah, I, I certainly resonate with those statements. Um, coming from Portland, I may be a bit biased because this is sort of quite popular in Portland. Um, how, how popular are these ideas here in Shanghai? Well, it's surprisingly catching on much faster than I expected. I, I, I began talking about eco-cities and learning about the importance of cities in terms of being a force for... Um, the, cu- the solution versus the problem, like, you know, we know that cities create all the pollution in the world. Basically, most of the pollution comes from cities because uh, all the buildings create lots of pollution and transportation and just the density of people in one place. You know, all those things create a huge amount of pollution. But however, uh, cities can also be the solution. So I've been exploring how could that be. And my particular interest and angle is through food because through food, uh, we can help to reduce pollution, water, air, and soil pollution, as well as increase our health mm-hmm. at the same time. And you see locally sourced food as one of the primary ways of doing that, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. So both aquaponics and farm to kitchen, uh, they are two different approaches to urban uh, sustainable food production and consumption. And the way that aquaponics works is that it's mimicking nature's way of growing food. So it will create a artificial. It will create a natural ecosystem, but in an artificial setting. Okay. It's kind of like a contradiction in terms, but in fact, it's quite ingenious. It's a it's a it's a antidote, I think, to industrial agriculture, which you know uses lots of chemical preservatives and pesticides and fertilizers, which all end up uh, harming soil, water, and air, and our health as well. In contrast, uh, aquaponics. Is uses no artificial harmful you know, inputs into, into the system because if you were to put anything harmful into the water or you know into, into that system, the fish or the plants would die. So aquaponics is, is a system where plants and, and fish grow together sure. in, a, in, a, in a 
in a um, in a uh, recirculating system where the water is reused by so the wastewater from the fish is becomes the food or the nutrient water for the plants. Plants take out the nutrients, which is the waste from the fish, and then thereby cleans the water back for the fish. And that's just exactly what happens in nature. Um, however, to make that work in a very efficient way uh, is still kind of an art research and development question. I mean, I think people are figuring it out, but to do it in a way that can be scaled up and it can be cost effective, I think there's a lot of work still to be done, and we're one of the people trying to figure that out. Okay, that's great. And um, more on the mm -hmm. traditional side of farming, what are some of the important elements of growing locally when you're just doing vegetables, per se? Well, right now, you know, including myself, we are so spoiled with having any kind of vegetable or produce that we want at any time of year, we've forgotten that, you know, things are grown in certain seasons. And, yeah. and I, I have to be, you know, Honestly, that I also have enjoyed, I don't even know, I didn't know until recently that, you know, carrots had a season. I thought okay. carrots are always available all the time, like they <laughs> always have been, right? right. But that's not really so. And what happens is that, you know, when things are not available in season, they have to be, they have to come to you from far away. And this actually creates our, uh, increase our increases our dependency on the fossil fuel resources, which we know are diminishing and are also create a lot of pollution in the world. So in order to reverse that uh, dependency on fossil fuels and reduce the pollution of air, water, and soil, uh, we, we do, if we buy more locally, uh, on the one hand, we don't have to ship food so far from so far away. We don't have to preserve that food, like you have to put a lot of preservatives on it in order to keep it you know, uh, viable until you receive it. We also don't have to um, use so many planes, trucks, cars, you know, to drive that food or get that food to us, which causes a lot of pollution as well. And on top of that, when you pick fruit or vegetables or produce when, before it's ripe or mature, you lose all, a lot of the nutritional value. So right. in eating locally, you actually uh, reverse all those negatives into positives by, um, you know, reducing the miles for the, for the food to get to you. You can then, you know, pick the food when it's closer to ripe, ripening and has more nutritional value, it tastes better, it also reduces the waste in the landfills because you don't need as much packaging, you don't need to have as many chemicals, it reduces the toxins in the environment. And people don't realize there's so many interrelated factors, but these we just take it for granted that this is just normal. But in fact, that normal um, condition has now created this incredible pollution that in Shanghai, as you can see, it's cloudy every day now. It didn't used to be like that when I came here 13 years ago. It was always you know, pollution, but it's just gotten so terrible. People don't realize that agriculture is one of the main sources of such pollution. Okay, well, we, we can reduce that. Yeah, you definitely habits. touched on a couple of really important issues, one being uh, protection of the environment and the other being a health issue. Is there anything else that comes to mind when you're thinking about sourcing locally food that's important? Yes, economically, we also want to support the local economy. When we buy food from far away, you know, we are supporting some corporate headquarters that could be in some other country, and profits go outside the local economy. I see. Meanwhile, the people who are growing the food here, you know, they don't have enough market, and then they may or may not be able to survive without the viable uh, consumer uh, market. So if we can support the people who are really doing excellent farming, who are doing farming that really helps the environment, helps our health, and uh, helps the local economy, this is all good. Great. Yeah, so it's also a means of developing a community, a local community. Absolutely. And people don't realize like who grows their food either. So sure. now by connecting people to the grower, you know, through the food, uh, we are creating that closer network of people who are supporting each other economically as well as socially and as well as, um, you know, ecologically. So I know you've been involved with aquaponics for a long time. How, how, um, how recently did you start the Farm to Kitchen? Farm to Kitchen was recent, like the past year. Okay. Because I realized aquaponics was taking a little bit longer to get up and running here. And so in the meantime, I don't, I'm not against soil-based farming. Aquaponics is soil-less farming, no soil in the, in the, in the growing process. Um, but I feel like we need both because you know, I love organic farming. I love, you know, the food, the produce that comes from organic farming. But because of the weather patterns changing so radically now, I believe that we can't only, we cannot only depend on soil-based farming. We have to have backup. And as well as population is increasing dramatically, especially in China. 
and around the world as well, and water resources are diminishing. So with all of these factors uh, coming into play, I really feel that we need to have uh, new ways of growing food that can feed large populations that use very little water, use very little energy, don't need the kind of old-fashioned farming skills that farmers, because there are less and less farmers actually, regular farmers are just you know, not being replaced by a new generation that quickly. So because of all these reasons, I really feel we need to supplement uh, organic or soil-based farming with non-traditional, more urban, technological, uh, sustainable farming methods. I, I wonder if one of the reasons it's um, the local food movement is catching on quicker is because just a generation ago, I would imagine that most of the food in China was sourced locally just because that was all that was available, whereas aquaponics is something that's definitely more on the fringe. It, it's new, and very few people have done it. Right. Is local farming, in your eyes, is this something that happens on a small scale, or is it something that could be larger as well? I'm thinking if we were to develop a vertical city, and we wanted to feed 250,000 people, and we'd like a majority of that food to be sourced locally, is that something that's possible, or what sort of special considerations need to be made? Well, it's really interesting that uh, several vertical city buildings that have come uh, up in the last year, it was one in China, in, in fact, in Hunan, they have already built into the infrastructure spaces for vertical farming inside the building. So I think this is a new, a new idea that is happening, not only, I think, in the Chinese building here, but I think in other buildings as well. Sure. And so this idea of integrating farming or agriculture and tall vertical buildings, vertical farming, basically, is really new, and I believe there's a huge potential in it. I mean, this is part, I think this would be related to aquaponics and maybe hydroponics as well, even though hydroponics is a little bit less you know, sustainable than aquaponics, but it's easier to, to grow and to uh, get large quantities because it's, it's more scientific in some ways. But in, in general, though, um, what's needed, though, to, to feed 250,000 people in a vertical city, I, I, again, I would say it would be a, a, a both and, you know, both the vertical farming in the building as well as the soil based farming around on the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, but we can't depend on only one or the other. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I actually interviewed uh, Dixon Despommier. Oh, yes. He was Hero. one of our previous parts. <laughs> Hero of mine. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely believe in his vision of creating vertical farms, but also echoing what you just said, I don't see it as being, we need traditional farming as well, and that's going to probably continue to be the largest producer of our food going forward for you know, the foreseeable future. Exactly. And Vertical Cities is a really fantastic way to open up urban uh, soil-based farming because it will reduce the land for urban sprawl. So therefore, you know, a lot of land, like even in Shanghai, used to be farmland. Like totally. in the, whole, the whole district of Pudong used to be farmland 20 or 30 years ago. Now it's all city. Right. However, that was good soil Know, farmland, and yeah. if we were, let's say, to if Shanghai became a vertical city, and that land was released from from buildings and could revert back to soil and for agriculture, uh, imagine how much more food could be grown for the growing population. Yeah, and, and locally, so it wouldn't have to travel a lot of food miles. In. Right, it might be extremely difficult to reclaim land that's already been converted to cities, but with the vertical city model, you can at least preserve or prevent other land. From right. Being Cumbered by these cities. Exactly, but you know, in some cities, I've heard that they've uh, they've converted some urban land to parks, and they've re restored uh, rivers and streams. Not rivers, but maybe streams that used to be like there's a lot of streams that used to be around Shanghai too. That's now highway or, or oh, wow. big avenues, and um, you know, if, if those could be re reverted back to some creeks or streams, you would then bring more nature back into the city as well. Yeah, excellent. So. With this farm to kitchen project, this sounds like from our previous conversation, this is pretty small scale, right? It's not a big operation. Right. Um, does local farming work best in that regard, or could you have some sort of hybrid of like, not necessarily a mega corporate farm, but something that is local but able to produce a significant amount of food, or is, would it be lots of smaller plots? I think the model that's going to work is cooperatives. Okay. I think that these farms do not scale up to a, a high, you know, to a very large level very well because it requires a lot of intensive care and work to to make sure you know 
all the elements of the farming process are, are taken care of in a, in a conscientious way. I think this is why people like uh, ecological farming is because there's a lot more attention to the growing of the food and the animals and you know all the ways that they mm-hmm. interact with nature and environment and health and not polluting things like that. So I think that it would be difficult to do a really large, enormous scaling up. Although I think there are some farms that do that. They're more like industrial model, but using more organic and sustainable farming methods. However, I feel that we want to encourage more ecological farmers to be able to go into the field as well. So I think if we can tie them together as a cooperative where they're all growing for a larger market, but they're not competing with each other, they're supporting and collaborating and cooperating with each other, this benefits the marketplace as well as benefits them, and it benefits the land, the soil, the water, the whole system, the whole ecosystem, the social and economic ecosystem, as well as the environmental ecosystem. So regarding the cooperatives, the question I have is, would these farmers, would they all be growing similar crops, or would one be growing carrots and the other one would be growing cauliflower, or are there everybody growing carrots? Well, I think that's the beauty of a cooperative. If, you, if people were talking with each other and organizing and coordinating with each other, they could grow very diverse crops based on the needs of the whole versus... Right. You know, if everyone thinks, oh, artichoke is really a good, uh, a good high margin, you know, vegetable, then okay. everybody goes artichoke, then the price of artichokes goes down, <laughs> totally, right? Totally, right. So then they're not actually getting the benefit of that yeah. high margin. But if there was a cooperative approach where people, let's say, you know, rotate the pricing of, of, of depending on what they are growing, like they either, you know, subsidize each other or there's a, a fair price that everybody gets paid a fair price no matter what they grow. I mean, there, there's many different possibilities, but I don't think any of this has ever really happened yet. But I would love to be somebody who helps that process uh, develop. And I guess by just the nature of the cooperative, it would be something that's sort of self-governing, right? The, the community farmers, they would come together and set their own regulations, or would you see some sort of governing body overseeing it? I would think that in China you would always have some governing bodies yeah, just for like health and safety, per, you know, and uh, risk factors and all of that. However, aside from that, if if it's possible to allow them a lot of freedom to self-organize and to self-organize in relation to the marketplace, it could be extremely exciting. I, I would love to be part of developing that whole model, even though it's not. I, I, I mean, I think there are models of cooperatives in the world, like, you know, Mondragon in Spain and other places, uh, but I don't know, right. I haven't studied it enough to know whether it applied to farming and farmers, but I'm imagining that it ought to be feasible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But, but, but the thing, the main thing, though, is the farmers themselves. Like, are they, how willing are they to cooperate versus compete? It's just, yeah. it's, it's about a mindset change. So part of the vertical city cultural development of the vertical city inhabitants is creating this new mindset change about what kind of citizens do we need to be in order to live in the next world that we are creating now. So right. the world that is going to be sustainable is going to be different than today, the environment today, the, the politics and social setup of today. You know, how do we make that leap to that to that next way of living and being and thinking and acting and behaving and sharing and cooperating? versus competing. So competing versus cooperating is a huge paradigm shift in the mind for the average person. Mm -hmm. And so it requires a lot of leaders to actually get it first and then really support, encourage others to join and reward that behavior versus, you know, making an uphill struggle for them to to make that work. Great. Those statements were sort of a perfect bridge into the next question I want to ask you, which is um, recognizing that culture is a huge element to the vertical city concept. It's not simply just about the infrastructure, but that we do really have to have the proper culture to make it function. How do you see food potentially supporting a future vertical city culture? I think it's the perfect um, medium for developing future culture, just because food already is a medium for people to come together around holidays, you know, uh, celebrations, milestones, fun, and relaxing with family and friends. It's already a venue, a, a cultural tradition that everybody understands and everybody needs and everybody, most yeah. people enjoy, I think. So to, to use it as a strategic as a strategy for incubating vertical city culture, I think it would be a, a brilliant way to help that by having people come to talk around food, you know, mm-hmm. because food is integral to our survival. 
food is integral to social networking and, and social cultural traditions. So we can utilize all these existing approaches to have people have conversations about what is the culture we're trying to create. This is the culture we're coming around, this is the culture that we already know, but what is the culture that we want to be in and help to develop for the next generation? That's a perfect place, eating delicious food together, enjoying health, you know, delicious healthy food, uh, sharing food that doesn't harm the environment, doesn't harm water, doesn't harm the air, doesn't harm your health, you know, while talking about what is the healthy, sustainable culture we're trying to create and eating this at the same time. I think this is a natural fit. Yeah, I think that definitely makes sense, um, breaking bread together, so to speak. But I guess if right. we're doing it in China, we're going to have to come up with a new expression. Baozi. Breaking Baozi. Breaking Baozi, yeah. <laughs> breaking, breaking steamed uh, buns. Right. Yeah. <laughs> See, that would perfect. be lovely too, right? <laughs> yeah, perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be really important for the government and other leaders to create new like architectural urban planning degrees and policies that would support and encourage urban farming and vertical farming because right now I know that you can't have a pet chicken in your apartment you know oh, okay. so <laughs> things like that and like even green rooftops that is a great idea and people are getting all excited about it but most of the rooftops in China in Shanghai I know don't cannot carry a heavy load so that would prevent let's say aquaponics being on the roof or that would make it difficult uh, to grow maybe green roofs. And then there are people who don't understand, like, growing a, why, why is a green roof nice or good to have? There would be maybe some people who would try to block that from happening. So this requires a lot of community education and, and a lot of promotional support by the government or by leaders to really make this idea attractive and, and to encourage it versus to make it difficult. Okay. To try to make it happen. So staying on this idea of, of culture in a vertical city for a moment, you touched upon um, the shift in mind from a competition to collaboration. Mm -hmm. And are there any other elements or maybe changes in paradigms that you would think people need to make in order to foster a, a very successful culture within a different urban form? There are, I think, some major um, shifts that in mindset. One is also from me to we. You know, like what benefits me and my family, my company, to what benefits all of us, and all of us including the natural world, all of us including the fish in the ocean, all of us including, you know, the non-human world, um, all of us including the future generations who have not yet been born yet. So this is a concept that I think most people are not thinking about yet. They're probably just thinking about my own survival, my own, you know, how will I make it through the next day, week, month, year, you know, how can I save enough money for my retirement? So this is part of the reason why we're in the predicament we're in right now is because everyone's just thinking and focusing on their own personal needs versus the collectives and the Earth's you know, needs. So I think we're going to move from a individualistic uh, orientation to a more global citizen type of an orientation. I think it's already happening. You know, people now traveling all around the world, they see a lot yeah. more than when I was young. I mean, when I was very young, we hardly ever went on an airplane. Now, everybody, including young pe kids and, you know, young people are on planes all the time, and they go all over the place. And so this has made the world smaller in some ways, which then helps people have a more global uh, image of themselves in the world. Absolutely, yeah. I That's been my experience from traveling. Um, it certainly has opened my eyes and, and made me feel more interconnected with my neighbors across the ocean. Yeah, and I think urban farming is such a great way to, to increase the feeling of not only your your place in the world in a social way, but it turns out that in the ecological farming, you know, whatever harms the soil, water, and air also directly harms our bodies. Mm -hmm. But people haven't really completely made that connection. They kind of understand it maybe Vaguely, but now through all these diseases that we're seeing, you know, um, cancer and diabetes and uh, all kinds of illnesses that are now really, really common. When I was young, they were, they were, we heard of them, but you hardly knew anybody who had it. Now it's like everyone knows people who are, you know, having who have cancer or some some debilitating uh, illness. And what what there is a closer and closer connection being made now between food and illness, and as well and food and healing too. So. 
food can be a cause for creating illness as well as food can be a cause for creating health and wellness. And this connection is the same as for the planet. You know, whatever you know, destroys your health is also destroying the health of the planet. Whatever destroys the health of the planet also destroys your health. So this connection of another global level of awareness, I think, is really important. And these sort of ideas are the ideas, if I'm understanding correctly, that you feel it would be important to have a successful vertical city culture. Yes. So the vertical city infrastructure already includes uh, some of these concepts, right? Because the whole idea of vertical is to reduce sprawl, which then reduces pollution, reduces the need for transportation long distances with cars and trucks and airplanes. You know, I mean, not eliminating that, but reducing it greatly, reducing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these, and then of course, you know, reducing trash, reducing um, you know food miles, reducing like making a pedestrian uh, walk it walkable distance between one point to another. These are all already built into the vertical city idea. However, we need to take those physical uh, infrastructure principles and integrate it into the living daily life and practices mm -hmm. of each individual. So you, what, you, what you wouldn't want, for example, is you know, in a vertical city, maybe you're much closer to your neighbors than you would be if you were living on a mansion on a, on a large estate, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So, but you would still have the issue of you want to be safe and secure and not harmed, you don't want to get mugged, if, you know, in a vertical, so if the thinking doesn't change, like in cities, people think it's sometimes dangerous, you know, that, you know, you could easily get uh, you know, mugged or, or robbed or pickpocketed or whatever, I mean, in every city that that's the case, um, but in a vertical city, you know, where people are so much more tighter in proximity to each other, would that danger increase or decrease, right? Mm -hmm. So in order for it to decrease, let's say, you would have to have, you know, a change in mindset where we would, you know, we know that a lot of the causes of crime and poverty is poverty and, and lack of education. So, would the vertical city have more, better education for everyone? Would there be a, you know, uh, a minimum level of, you know, where people would not go below poverty? And these are all net. like a safety net. Yeah. So, and, you know, maybe this would cost some extra money, but would it be worth it in order for people to all feel safer? So, these are questions that haven't been answered yet and hasn't been figured out yet, but these are mm -hmm. questions I think to be asked and to be thought about and to be brainstormed collectively because it's the world that we want to create. So we decide, you know. Okay. So I'm on board. Um, if we're going to create a vertical city, I want it to be a place that's safe and I want it to be a place that's sustainable and I want it to be a place where we all work together. How do we get from where we are now to there? It seems like we can't just, you know, build it and then throw a bunch of people in there. There's gotta be some sort of steps in between and as you mentioned earlier, some significant leadership. So where does that leadership come from or how do we develop a seed to really create that culture as we do start to build vertical cities in the future? Well, I have an idea, which I don't know will happen or not, but I, I believe a great idea would be to screen or to select the first group of pioneering vertical city residents okay. that they should not just be anyone who has, let's say, money. Like that should not be the criteria. The criteria ought to be should not be like a real estate transaction. It should not be like, oh, you know, this apartment costs X amount of money, and if you have that money, you can be a resident in this part of the city. I think that's not good enough. That's the existing status quo model. I really think that if you want to create a new culture with, uh, you know, new community uh, consciousness and uh, you know, integrating a lot of new ideas that are maybe the cutting edge best practices in in uh, eco-city or eco-village uh, thinking, we should invite the people who really have something to contribute and who are interested in experimenting along these kind of values of sharing, cooperation, uh, non, you know, not, not, like, not competition, but you know, I, I'm not saying competition is bad, but not the kind of competition where it's cutthroat and it's like dog eat dog and you know, yeah. look out for me over everybody else. I mean, there's ways that it could be cooperative competition, let's say, or, or healthy competition. Uh, there could be people with company. I think there are thought leaders all around the world who have already been experimenting in the communities, like intentional communities, eco villages. There's like hundreds of eco villages all over the United States. I'm sure all over the world. Uh, and you know, who are those folks? And what have they learned? They they know that it's difficult to live in a in a community where you're trying to be sustainable and you know, individual respecting individual boundaries as well as having cooperative and collective uh, goals and and uh, values, right? So they would be the people, I would say, would have a lot to say about how to set up this culture and what would be the 
ways that work and don't work. So I would say that let's invite those people and the thought leaders, you know, the people who are developing new ideas around sharing, shareism, uh, people who are doing the eco, not the, the uh, cooperative, the co-working spaces, okay. you know, all the folks who are doing a lot of those kind of cutting edge social enterprise uh, development. Who are they? And, and invite those folks, you know, or businesses that are social enterprises who are triple bottom line and people who are already kind of along on that road of developing towards that culture, but maybe they've been doing it more in isolation or, you know, they maybe they have their own network, but they don't have all their networks. They're not integrated yet. Bring those folks together, have them figure out how to integrate all these networks together, you know, food and, uh, you know, consumables and, and business and education and, and health and hospitals. You know, how can all of these systems work together cooperatively? I think right now a lot of the breakdowns in the world are that there's lack of cooperation among these institutions or these systems. So we need to have people who want to figure it out to mm -hmm. be together. Let's not invite the people who are going to come and just fight with each other. You know, let's invite the people who have a passion for, for learning how to do this and, and are willing to dedicate time, energy, effort to make it happen. Okay, uh, great. So I have one remark on competition and then a follow-up question for you. My most recent interview that I did for the podcast was with Kellogg Wong, and something that he said after we stopped the interview, which I thought was really interesting, he was talking about this idea of competition, um, specifically as it is in America, and that a lot of Americans have this idea that in competition, it's all about winning. And you either win, and if you haven't won, then you're nothing. You're totally a loser. But in, he had, um, was talking about some experiences he had in Australia where they have often a different mentality where the value is actually in the competition itself. Mm -hmm. And the, by being a part of engaging in this, this struggle or, or this um, quest to improve yourself and, and using others to kind of, you know, as a mirror to reflect back on yourself and, and to compete with one another, that the value is actually in the competition and not in the winning. And so I just wanted to bring that comment up because I thought it was an interesting remark that he made. Mm. And I think there's a lot of value in that statement. Right. All right. So then my follow-up question for you is, I like this idea of kind of handpicking people. I think that it's something that should be explored. But how does, it still seems like there's some steps missing because you can't handpick everybody forever, right? So what do you do? So maybe that works in the first vertical city. Then, then what happens? Um, that's a great question. And I believe that it would be really important to document the process of how all this happens. Like make it like a reality show or something, you know, where people are acting themselves. Yeah. They're being themselves and they are documenting their reactions to all the issues, challenges, problems, uh, highlights, lowlights that come up. And if there could be a way in which, I, there's already a community doing this by the way actually. Uh, there's there's a, a intentional community happening in Australia that I heard that they are documenting themselves for a year. Really? Yes, they're, a they're creating a permaculture society to, among themselves and they are having, they invite a filmmaker to, to film them for one entire year. Wow. to document all of their ups and downs and challenges. Mm -hmm. But how interesting that could be, because if you knew that you were being observed and that your reactions are going to be seen by posterity, would that change how you speak to each other? Would that change how you, you know, uh, contribute? Would that change how you interact? You know, would that Good cause question. you to try harder? Would that cause you to, you know, act out even more, be a drama queen? I don't know. I, you know, I don't know what would happen, but wouldn't it be interesting that everything that we're doing is not for us, but for the next generation? And, you know, we're putting ourselves out there to try this mm -hmm. and see, if, see what happens. And putting our best self forward, I think that's the concept I think would be the most interesting. How, what would that look like if everybody put their best self forward for a year? Not forever, but maybe, you know, you would go back for know, a month or two or three, but what if you could do it for, let's say, just a, a, a set amount of time? You know, let's okay. say after the year, you could go back to being, you know, the stupid. Usual if, jerk. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to be stupid, go ahead, go back to being stupid. But if you, let's say, what if you were your best, smartest, you know, your best self uh -huh. for, for a certain amount of time? Let's say people could come in and out of that process. Let's say, you know, you decide you, you'll have a month. You would like to be part of the experiment for a month. 
I could do it for, let's say, three months. Mm. And then there's somebody else who do it for six months or a year. You know, what would happen? How would, and how, I don't know. I have no idea how that would work. It could be like a, a grand social experiment, and that would be interesting. Yeah, that would be interesting. Um, do you think it's really feasible to select enough people to fill a whole vertical city? Or would it be something maybe on a smaller scale to start with and then work your way up? Right. So I think that there are already a lot of intentional communities and eco-villages uh, eco already been working on these questions and problems around the world. So I think that there's a lot to learn from them. I don't know have, if they've shared all their information with each other. But I know some people who are organizers in that area, I could call and find out if, if they've you know, consolidated what their learnings are over these decades. Uh, yeah, I think there's already been quite a lot of small-scale innovation in little pockets, and we should learn from them what, what they've done mm -hmm. and what they've, what they've benefited from and, and where the mistakes were and how to uh, do it better. So I do like the idea of if we were to do this sort of social experiment and then having it so that it's available on all the media sources for people to see, but it seems like that still is almost maybe not quite enough to make the gap to the next or to you know once we build other developments and so i'm wondering if maybe it would make sense if you have this community and it is successful and then they become ambassadors or, yeah. or like mm -hmm. the, the viral um you know the virally tra viral transmitters of the culture yeah. that would yeah. be awesome too that, that would be, be interesting, interesting. Yeah. perhaps maybe the community is established for a year or two and then um, as other communities are developed a certain number of these people go and become sort of the founding members right, the, the of that founding society. Seeds. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And to use the ecological agriculture model, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and they would have obviously have learned a lot um, mm -hmm. through their past year or two of living in that community, and then they would be able to pass those lessons forward to the next right. wave of people coming like in. It, it kind of sounds like a little bit of an ev evangelical model, which I have a little bit of a question about because. I think that everywhere you go in the world, what I've seen is that you know when someone comes from afar and like puts themselves as an authority, they know something more than you. There's going to be automatic allowing resistance to that. So there yeah. has to be maybe you know every every community sends their own people to be uh, this vertical center, uh -huh. right? To be the seeding the seeding community, and then those folks take a few others with them and go back to their community. So they become the bridge. So Actually, in cross-cultural training, we, we talk a lot about this, that when you travel abroad and you live abroad for a while, like a year or more, or, you know, five or ten years, when you go back to your home culture, you're really not the same as your home culture right. anymore. Reverse and, cultural shock. Right. And oftentimes, the folks who you left behind or the people who you're going back to, they really don't understand what you've been through. You know, so... We even did this in leadership training. Like, if a group of leaders go through a training, like a leadership training, sure. and they go back all excited to their team, but the team didn't go through the training, yeah, there's a disconnect, right? Totally. So you're talking about how to bridge that disconnect. I think it's it's a challenge, and that has to be figured out. But I think one way is to have, you know, lots of folks going to the vertical city to live there for a while, and maybe there will be a continuous loop of folks going. That's you know, a good Not idea. like just a group of people come back and then you know, tell them how it is, but there's a continuous, like every one or two years, you know, there's a new batch that That's, comes yeah. and, and becomes, and then they, and because every, because there's also an evolutionary trend too, like what you learned in the first, let's say you were the founding member for the first two years, you know, by the time the third or fourth generation of founding members come back and forth, it's already going to be a completely different culture than when sure. you were there. So there's, there has, so this forces, I think, the future community to communicate intensively even more than now what we're used to and i think it's going to be easier with social media with you know all these different channels for interactive communication and interactive uh internet of things you know so uh, the possibilities are probably much greater now than we could imagine at the moment that i could imagine but maybe some people can imagine <laughs> i think this would be very exciting to do this yeah i really like that idea of um having new people come into the, the already established community. Um, and bring fresh ideas and, and yeah. ask the old questions, but maybe it gets answered in new ways every time, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, then you evolve the methodology for how to transfer the not the best of knowledge. And, you, and it can't be rigid. It has to be a living, 
knowledge. It cannot be like, here's the rule that Moses came from the mountain and said, you know, the Ten Commandments. I don't think that kind of model really would work anymore. But, you know, what people could do is, this is what we've seen, this is what we've seen works, you know, we don't know what will work here, but what do you think about this? And it has yeah. to be like a, a respectful, mutual sharing, and I think this issue of dignity and sharing is so important that we don't, we don't, you know, look down on the folks who didn't have the privileged experience that we had of living there for, let's say, two years. You know, we, we, we bring everybody up versus we, we don't continue to keep dividing ourselves between each other, but we, we bring everyone more and more together. I think if we have kind of a guiding principle like that, which is open and flexible, you know, we don't know, like maybe in every place it's done differently, but the concept is that no matter what we do, we always, you know, must have uh, offer dignity to to whoever we're working or speaking to, that we always offer uh, benefit, that we're never only benefiting ourselves alone, you know, that we have to do this kind of non-ego uh, approach to life, but that requires you know, training, thinking, working, you know, struggling a little bit maybe sometimes. But I think this is what would, you know, possibly work. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of having new people come in, it reminds me of a social experiment that I once saw where they had a bunch of actors in the lobby of, I think it was like an eye, eye doctor or something like that. They, they were offering a free eye examinations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a bunch of actors are in there and then one real person comes in and sits down to wait for her eye appointment and this bell rings and all the actors stand up and then they and just a second later they sit back down and um this lady is like totally confused <laughs> for the first few rounds but then after it happens maybe four or five times she, she starts up. standing up mm -hmm. right and then another outsider comes in they go through the same process and they end up um, conforming mm -hmm. to the norms mm -hmm. And then after time, all the actors leave, and so you have none of the original players there. And everybody still stands up. But yes, and because the two people who had been influenced to stand up, they stand up when the bell rings, and so mm -hmm. they they're basically teaching this new crop of people who are coming in. Right. Um, that experiment didn't last as long as a you know um, the sort of experiment we're proposing. So there wasn't any sort of evolution of that activity. But right. it would be interesting to see. But if, also what's missing in that experiment was there's no questioning about why are we standing up. So I would expect that in this culture of creation, co-creating a new culture, there would be lots of questions. Sure. You know, there are constant questions like why are we doing this? You know, is this the best way? Is there a better way? You know, what's your way? What's my way? What's his way, her way? You know, then yeah. I think that that would be the – I would hate – because what, what I just heard you said, I experimented, although it sounds amusing and, and interesting and definitely provocative – but there's also like a danger to people just being groupthink. Well, totally. Right? And yeah. we don't necessarily, I don't think that is the basis of an ecological civilization is that everyone's just groupthink. I think that people are doing it out of their own free will, that they understand that this is, you know, evolving themselves as well as evolving the collective. I mean, I think to me that that's important. I don't know if it's important to everyone, but I would say that I would not, I would not want to do something just because it's a rule that we have to be. I just saw a play actually called Dirt Chinese where there were these rules about sustainability. Okay. And it was really scary because you could see how anything that becomes too rigid becomes oppressive. So even a yeah. good rule like taking a nap in the afternoon, but if you have to take a nap, you know. I don't want like, a nap today. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's now like, you know, afternoon, you must go take a nap for one hour. You know, that then doesn't become enjoyable. It doesn't, it doesn't feel... Even though it might be good for your health, but this, you lost something in the process. So how can we create a culture where there's a feeling of freedom, joy, lightness, you know, and, and sharing, but in a, in a joyful, happy, not a oppressive way? So I don't know how that could be. That sounds like utopia, right? But I really believe that we make the choice of heaven or hell in our daily life and in, in our collective life. And why not choose heaven? I mean, I don't think that that means it has to be utopia. I think this has to be that everyone... You know, choosing to be happy versus versus whatever else. <laughs> sure, unhappy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> or, or suffering, I guess, with the Buddhist word, suffering. Since I brought up that social experiment, I should I should mention that I did. Uh, I saw it when I was flying some at some point, and it was like a TV show. So I don't know how valid that mm -hmm. experiment was but at the end there was one gentleman who just like flat out refused he's like i don't know what all you crazy people are doing <laughs> but i'm sitting here with my arms crossed and i'm not standing up <laughs> see so, so he's the um you know the disruptive factor yeah <laughs> totally disruption, this is a disruption so 
actually what we're proposing is a disruption to the norm, mm -hmm. but then there's going to be other disruptions to other norms, right? Um, I mean, I think it has to be collectively figured out. It might take us 100 years, who knows? It may not be that fast. It may not be mm -hmm. in my lifetime, but I think it's a worthy goal. So, you know, if it's a worthy goal, it'll, it'll keep going. Okay. So uh, we're kind of nearing the end here. I'm wondering if you have any additional thoughts you've been thinking that you haven't had a chance to express that you would, you would like to get out. And then um, if you do, then great. If you don't, then I'll have one more final question for you. Okay. Um, Think back about everything we discussed and was there anything that you didn't have an opportunity to express? Well, I, I've just been enjoying this conversation. I haven't been thinking. I mean, I have lots of ideas, but I don't know if, if that's necessary. Just okay. Right now, but, um, well, no worries. Um, then are you ready for the big finale? Yeah, yeah. All right, great. So I always like to end the podcast by asking guests if they have a specific call to action or any parting words that they would like to make to our listeners before we say goodbye. Okay, well, I would say the call to action I would propose is to support the local eco growers or eco farmers in your community just because. These are people who are, most, for the most part, they're not doing it to become rich and famous. They're doing it because they care about the land, you know, the food, the solution, uh, the pollution. They care about, you know, making people happy, healthier, and uh, they deserve support. They are not necessarily big corporations that have lots of budgeting for sales and marketing. So, you know, a lot of those folks are doing. They really love farming. My my experience of these farmers is that they love farming. They prefer like not to have to talk to anybody. Just okay. be on the land and do their do their thing, right? So if we can, and people sometimes always you know say, oh, organic food is more expensive, and you know, blah blah blah. But I really feel that if you understand the way the food system works, it's really not expensive. The the, the reason why it costs maybe some more than industrially grown agricultural products is because industrial agriculture is subsidized. If it were not subsidized, it would cost as much as or more than the ecological produce. And on top of that, not only it costs the same or more, but it's also destroying environment, water, soil, air, and your health at the same time. And who pays for you when you get ill? It's not the people who make the money off of you when you bought their produce. You know, you're paying it out of your own savings. So if you're supporting the local eco-farmers, you're not only helping the local economy, you're also decreasing pollution, you're also improving your health, you're also improving the, the environmental sustainability of your local land, which can only be good, in my opinion. So that's my, my recommendation and, and suggestion for And, you know, I, I really, if you get to know the farmers, they're all incredibly interesting and wonderful people, at least the ones that I've met here in Shanghai area. There, none of them have none of the farmers that I meet with on a regular basis are originally farmers. They were all professionals that became farmers. So they're not doing it because you know that it was tr traditional in their family that they had to become a farmer because their dad or their grandfather and everybody in their future in their in their um, uh, ancestry were farmers. It's because they chose this, and they're making probably a lot less money than they were in their professionals as professionals in their, in their previous careers. So. Uh, they deserve the support, and, and, and they're growing fabulous, great food, and it tastes delicious. It tastes delicious, It yeah. tastes so much better. I mean, when you eat a real sweet carrot, I mean, it's just amazing. And I, I had a potato, you know, from a farm recently that I couldn't even, I mean, I, I didn't believe how excited I was about the taste of this potato, because it tasted so much like a potato. I mean, it was like amazing. <laughs> I mean, I was shocked at how, how I was so excited, because it was just a potato, but the flavor was huge. Great. And so that, I think, is a joy. People, should, I think everyone should have that opportunity to have that experience and to enjoy that. And, and why not? For me, the tomatoes are the big ones. When oh, I get a yes. locally grown tomato, oh my gosh, it's so much better. And then the heirloom vegetables, too. You know, if they also cost more. I, I know that. And I ask my farmers, like, why does it cost so much more? Like this purple rice, you know, why does it cost, like, ten times more than the regular rice? They said that it's because it's a low-yield rice. Uh, and you see, so they, they can only, it doesn't grow more than a certain amount per land, per piece of land. Hmm. And so therefore, but if they don't grow it, but, but the, the good side is that even though it's cost more, it has like three or four times the nutrient value of regular oh, rice. Wow. So you're getting all these other vitamins and micronutrients that other rices don't have. And if they don't grow it, this kind of rice would maybe just go extinct, or not extinct, but you know, just like, it will just... It does just disappear because nobody wants it. Won't it won't be available. Right. It will not even be available. So in all of these different diversity of crops, 
uh, is a part of the biodiversity of the region, and biodiversity is a key factor in the health of the land. Because the more diverse the crops, the more there is balance. If, if let's say a pestilence, you know, uh, comes around, not all the crops fail because yeah. they have different different immune immunities, <laughs> different kinds of um, you know conditions. So you have a lot more resilience in the soil and in the land, mm. and so this is all good for our health. So, and then the, of course it tastes fabulous, which you have no idea. You know, I, I never had seen purple rice before. Um, it's just delicious. It's amazing. So everyone should have an uh, opportunity to try that if they wanted to. And, and we should support the farmers because these are farmers who grow this and, you know, they only grow a small amount of it anyway. So why not, you know, enjoy it? Great. Well, then, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I truly appreciate it. Um, I'd like to invite our guests to check out the show notes and links to everything we discussed by visiting verticalcity.org slash podcast. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of Vertical City. Learn more about the Vertical City concept and continue the conversation by visiting our website, verticalcity.org. I truly hope that you've enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe to our podcast, leave a review on iTunes, and most importantly, share Vertical City with your friends and colleagues so that together we can create solutions for sustainable living. I'm Lennon Richardson, signing off for the Vertical City team. See you next time.